Romans chapter 2. <laughs> Let's start off with a question this morning. Have you ever seen or been in a situation where two individuals or two groups of people just don't get along? Now, everybody's thinking, I know some groups like that. Maybe you start thinking in terms of, I've been in that situation. We have a hard time getting along with others. How many times in the midst of those situations, they can be among long-term friendships, they can be in marriages, they can be in communities, how often in the midst of those situations, if we find ourselves in them, do we look at ourselves as being the problem? Who do we usually want to point the finger at first? It's always because of them. Usually, we think in terms of if they would just change, this would be easy. If you notice it here in the book of Romans, we've talked a little bit about this in the past of the setting. The Jews were there, the Jewish Christians established a, a congregation of the Lord's people, the saints there in Rome. And then Emperor Claudius came along. And he told all the Jews they had to leave. It didn't matter whether they were Christians or not. Every Jew had to leave Rome. And so as part of that, the Gentiles had started to become converted. And so they were there, but as some might think, they were left unattended. They weren't familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. And so here were all the Jewish Christians, along with the Jews who had no relationship with Jesus. They were all being cast out of Rome. And so the Gentiles, they kept on worshiping God with everything that they knew. And then as the Roman Caesar Claudius died and his laws kind of went with him, all of a sudden some Jewish Christians come back to Rome. And they kind of start looking around and going, you guys are so unorthodox. You don't, you don't do things right. Because they still had all these things from the Old Testament governing their minds. Now, as the book unfolds and comes together, Paul's going to show them, oh, you think, you think the other ones are the problem, huh? For the Gentile Christians, they were looking at the Jewish Christians and saying, you know, if they would just change, things would be a lot easier. Gentile Christians were looking at the Jewish Christians who had just come back and saying, what's wrong with you all? Paul brings it all together. Now, here in Romans chapter 2, real quickly, I want you to look at verse 9. He says, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, for the Jew first and also of the Greek. Where do these things affect you? Internally? In the soul? But I want you to, to take special note. He says, there will be tribulation and distress. What's the difference between tribulation and distress? Where does distress hit you? Inside. Tribulation, where does it affect you? Outside as well. Now, how did these tribulations and distresses come? They came against every soul, and why? Who does evil. Now, real quickly, turn back to Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. When is the wrath of God revealed? Who is it revealed against? Those who suppress the truth. He says unrighteous, ungodly. 
And he says, and it is revealed now. So whenever you look over at Romans chapter 2 and you see verse 9, he says, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul who does evil. So is the wrath of God something for far off later? Present. Correct? Now, he says, for every soul of man who does evil. I want you to kind of think about this for a second. Whenever you make evil choices, do you find tribulation? Let's, let's kind of put this in a setting. Let's present day setting for a moment. Whenever you lie to your boss, are you about to bring tribulation on yourself? All right. Now, it says, depends on if you get caught. Now, here comes to the second part, even if you don't get caught. What hits you on the inside? Distress. Now, does this mean every tribulation is because of evil? No. But notice here, this is what evil pays out. We'll make our own trouble. You ever heard somebody say, oh, they're their own worst enemy. Why? You do evil, here comes tribulation and distress. So it affects you on the inside. How far down does it go? To the very soul. Now, is this different for Jews and Greeks? <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek. Then, look down at verse 11, same chapter, Romans 2, 11. For there is no partiality with God. Is God partial in how he does this? Does he say, well, if you're a Jew, I do it this way. If you're a Gentile, I do it this way. He says, no, this is the way it always works. Tribulation and distress on every soul who does evil. And notice it says does. It's not even an ongoing, a continuation. So, he says, and there's no partiality with God. Why is God not partial? He's righteous? Now, I'm going to flash forward for just a second so that we can make sure and see it as we go through this passage. Romans chapter 3. Look over at verse 22. You kind of pick up in the middle of a thought here, but he says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, Righteousness, is there a distinction on that side? We see there's no distinction on the wrath side in chapter 2. Is there a distinction on the righteous side? No. Then notice verse 23. Why is there no distinction? You read it and tell me. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is it pretty easy for God to show no distinction? Everybody falls under the same category, right? Whenever we become of age where we can make our own choices and we choose sin over righteousness, God says, no distinction. Now, we start to look at that, and we can pretty quickly see, okay, there's no distinction. We, we get that. God's not distinct in terms of whether he's revealing wrath, whether it be internal or external. He has not showed distinction in terms of righteousness, when it comes through Jesus, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, quickly you see about God, he is not partial. If you've ever thought in terms, yeah, I've done what's wrong, but God's going to be okay with me. What are you not seeing? The righteousness of God that he's not partial. Well, it's okay for me, but it's not okay for you. What is that? partiality. Now, this is what was going on among the Jews and the Gentiles, the saints in Rome. Now, look at verse 12. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Now, 
What's the conclusion of these things? See, all have to pay the penalty. God's not partial. He says, all who have sinned without the law, now who would that be? Gentiles. He says, will also perish without the law. He says, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Who are those who are under the law? Jews. Now notice, a little different, but the same. Then, if you, if you take the note here, he says, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And the idea of perish is not only to die, it's actually the idea of, and to suffer for it. Sometimes we just say, oh, they perished in the, in the car accident. Well, we're saying they died and they suffered at it too. I'm not saying it's because of sin, but just the way we use the words. Then, he says, here they are. They're without the law. They're going to perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. The law is going to be the standard here. Then, verse 13. This is a special note for the Jewish Christians. He says, for it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. What's the point? Going to have to be a follower, not just a hearer, right? He says, what good is it just to know the right thing to do? It does have a little bit of value, but it doesn't have much value until when? Until you embrace it by faith to actually do it. But we're talking about the Jewish people. This is about the law. So whenever we're talking about the law, what are we really talking about? Old covenant? Some people would say the law of Moses. He says, it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God. What was going on among the Jewish people there in Rome? They had become a bunch of people who said, we're better than you because we have the law. You may be Gentile Christians, you don't know as much as us. Now, let's, let's get to some at-home application. Let me give this to you, and you can, you can tie this in most of the way through the rest of the book. If you want to see this, because we go, you know what, we don't have a whole lot of Jews here, we're going to have a lot of trouble with Gentiles. Let me tell you how this presents itself nowadays. There are some individuals who came to know Christ at a very young age. Maybe they were in their late teens, early 20s. And they have been able to know the Lord, to have scripture put in front of them, maybe even by their parents, by a, a loved one, a friend. And they have come to take those things and let them shape them ever since they were young. Who do you think they would be compared to in the Gen Gentile and Jew situation? Jews. Then you have other people who are converted later on in life. Maybe they're not, maybe they're in the 40s or 50s, or e even older. And they were not raised around anything where the Bible was put in front of them. And they weren't made to, to really look at Scripture a lot. They didn't see a lot of family examples of people striving to follow, be followers of Jesus. And they come in, they don't have a whole lot of knowledge on the backside of prior experiences who would they be compared to in the Jew-Gentile relationship? Gentiles. So realize, some of these same principles would still apply in application. Is it easy for those who say, you know what, I've been reading the Bible all my life, my grandmother taught me this whenever from the time I was knee-high to a grasshopper, and say, and here you are coming in and you say this, who do you think you are? Oh, maybe you have a Gentile who comes in and says, well, I don't know those things. You make me feel like I'm inferior, like, like I'm second class, like I don't have the same salvation that you do. Paul goes back to the real application. He says, you know what? You know it, but you're not doing it. 
Imagine being a 21st century Christian in our day and age. We think we got the right answers, but we're just not living it. Are we any better off? No. If you notice it here, for it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God. Now, we're not talking about law for our application. We're talking about just understanding new covenant principles, the principles of Christ. But for them, he says law. He says, who are just, but the doers of the law will be justified. I want you to think about that word justified. You're going to hear that word a lot this morning. When you hear the term justified, what do you think of? Not guilty. Now, justified really has the idea of you've been declared innocent by the one who has authority. Now, think about that. You've been declared innocent by the one who has authority. Ever do something and say, I justified my actions. Do you have authority to do that? See, it's a perversion of the term, isn't it? Because you have to have someone who has authority to declare you innocent. How many people go into a court case saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. The judge says, no, you're not. You're guilty. Whose verdict stands? The one who has authority. So, he says, all right, it's the doers of the law will be justified. Now, here's the trouble. How many people in the history of planet Earth could keep the law? One. Now, I want you to think about what that says. Now, we're, we're going we're gonna to step away from Romans for just a second. Look over at the book of James. Look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Look down at look down at verse 9. But if you show partiality well, let's just see what's going on here. The book of James was, was written to a bunch of people who had been scattered because of persecutions. Specifically written to a bunch of Jewish Christians who had been scattered. What were they doing? If you were to sit back and read through the first seven, eight verses of chapter two, you'd come to find out they're being partial. Somebody's coming into their assembly and they're dressed really nice, and they get special attention, and somebody else comes in with kind of old raggedy clothes, and they say, well, you, you, you can sit by my feet. Here, smell my feet. They're being partial. Now, James points out, and remember, Spirit of God inspires this. He says, you need to see an application. He says, you should know better. Now, if you look back at verse 8, he says, If, however, you're fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture. Royal. If we're talking about royalty, what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? King. Who's the king? King Jesus. He says, if you're going to fulfill Jesus' law, the royal law, he says, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. What is the royal law? You ever thought about it? What's the king's law? He says, love your neighbor. As, here he says, as yourself. We know Jesus up, upped it a little bit higher. He says, you love people like I love you. Sometimes that's greater than what we think the standard is. But then verse 9, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What if you're just showing partiality? It's not that you've said something out of anger. It's not that you've, you've had some action of pushing someone else aside. He says, but what if you're just showing partiality? What do you know about God? He is not partial. And if you're going to imitate him, that means we can't be partial either. He says, but if you are showing partiality, you are committing, what's the word? Sin. Now, think about that. 
Think about how many different ways you can cut partiality. Name me a few. Politics, religion, race, education. You can hit all, all sorts of areas, can't you? Does God divide the line among those things? Not partial. Where does God divide the line? Righteous? Unrighteous. Because the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. That's the line. We don't look at the way he draws things sometimes, do we? Boy, we sure need to. It's our soul that's hanging in the balance. He says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin. He says, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Well, it's just one transgression. It's just one sin. Well, keep reading the next verse. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. What does the law do? Convicts, condemns. It says if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. I think of it sometimes like a a leaky roof. If you got one hole, you got a leaky roof. It's not the idea of what. Well, as long as you, if you don't, if you don't have more than a hundred holes, you don't have a leaky roof. What? You know, you don't think that way. He says one. So for the Jews, what if you fail in just one thing? What does the law convict you as? Guilty. Come back over to Romans chapter two. So in verse 13, he says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. What if you just messed up once? Guilty. Well, that's exactly what he said the law would do. It would judge you. Most people don't realize it. It's really more so in other places. Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, do you realize the law is not for the righteous? He says the law always points out sin. Later on in Romans, he's going to say, so that we would know that sin is utterly sinful. We would see how against God it really is. Then, notice how this continues, verse 14. For when Gentiles, all right, well, we've dealt with the Jewish side. You fail once, how do you stand before God under that old, old covenant? The one that you're bragging about having. The one that you think that makes you so much better than these Gentiles. And guess what it says about you? Guilty. Then, He flips it over to the other side. What about those who are without law? Verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. Now, don't get caught up in all the the verbiage here. What's he really saying? If you don't have the law, he says, but you instinctively do the things of the law. He says, not, although not having the law, in other words, Old Testament, he says they're a law to themselves. Well, that sounds interesting. Now, let's, let's see some everyday application. You ever run across human beings and think to yourself, and you know them well enough to know, they, they just don't respond to spiritual things. You, you want to put Christ in front of them, that just doesn't, it just doesn't do anything. They don't have a response or a conviction about it. But yet, we say, they're very compassionate people. They, they show kindness where other people don't even engage. And you look at them and kind of scratch your head and think, Would God condemn them? They seem to be such a, now you fill in the bank, good person. That's the terminology we use. God knows that. He says, now they don't know the Old Testament scriptures. They're not a Jew. And you go, 
how's God going to look through these things? Is he going to be partial? No. Where does he draw the line? Righteous and unrighteous, good and evil. He says, and these people are allowed to be a law to themselves? What does that mean? Well, look at the next verse. He's going to explain it. Verse 15. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Now, he says, they show the work of the law written in their hearts. Who wrote it there? Think about it. Remember before in the, in the book of Romans it says, you know, evidence? They have no excuse? Ever wonder why? He says, look, they have a conscience. Now, conscience is a word that sometimes we give more, more value to than what it really is. Um, conscience, the the Greek word as well as the English word just literally means with knowledge. If you think about the prefix C-O-N, it means with. Guess what science means? Knowledge. He says conscience is about how do you do things based upon what you know. You ever had, <coughs> excuse me, you ever had a situation where you, you made a wrong move because you just didn't know the situation? Ever stuck your nose in a situation and thought, I should have just kept my mouth shut? Ever had that one? And you go, what's the problem? I didn't know anything. Oh, you mean your conscience didn't tell you to stop because you didn't know much enough. Then you figured it out and you learned your lesson. Hopefully don't do it so much anymore. Maybe even not at all. That'd be wonderful. But he says here, he says, they show the work of the law written in their hearts. What is God wanting from man? What does he want? Contrite heart? Does he want to give man life? Remember what this book's about. If you think back to chapter 1, he says, For the gospel is the power of God for salvation. He says, and I'm going to convict them. And what's he going to use against them? Their own thinking. Now, I want you to go back in your mind before you were converted to Christ. Did you have a sense on some level? I'm not saying it's the same as what God's level was. But did you have a sense on some level of right and wrong? Did you live up to your own standard? Anybody live up perfectly to their own standard? I, now, I want to make an assumption here. Are there any Jews among us? Anybody who's got bloodline that goes back to a Jewish way? Okay, so what are we dealing with right now? A whole bunch of Gentiles. So guess where you fit right here? So your conscience, whenever you would do something, would say... If you did something that you knew was wrong, when you lied, maybe we tried to manipulate a situation to get the outcome we wanted, and then it happened and it all blew up, what was your conscience telling you? You know this is your fault, right? You know you made the decisions. Look at what you've caused. Tribulation hit from the outside, the distress came from the inside, and what did you know about your status? Were you innocent or guilty? Guilty. Now, he makes the statement here. He says, they do instinctively the things of the law. These not having law are law to themselves. Well, how do they hold up to their own law? Verse 15. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. But there are also times where you did do what was right, and your conscience said, good job. Your friends over here, they didn't do the right thing. You did good. 
proud of him. But then the next time he did something wrong, what happened? Oh. Now, there's an extreme term that's used these days. It's a psychological term for this same thing. You ever heard the term bipolar? Polar ends. Sometimes a person is really, really happy. Why? They're doing good things in their mind, according to their own standard. And then they do something that's terrible. What happens? Guilt, 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 guilt. And then it starts to happen where they feel guilty, but then they do something good, and they feel good, but they feel guilty about feeling good because they know what they did. See how this works? How come the world doesn't have an answer for this? Because what has to be addressed? Sin. And when sins are addressed, what happens? Now there has to be a conviction toward Christ. Because remember, the gospel is the power to save among how many people? All. And God's the respecter of persons? Not at all. Now, see, you have to bring these things before God because he's the one who can deal with them. He's the one. What about whenever a man sits back and says, I'm innocent? Does he have the authority to proclaim himself innocent? No. Now, so take another look here in verse 15. He says, their conscience bearing witness. Now, think about it. He says, let me tell you about the witness. He says, your conscience is going to stand up as a witness. When you think of witnesses, what scenario do you think of? Court? Trial? It's usually on, on court days or trial days, you want witnesses to show up. You want them to show up if you are innocent? Do you want them to show up if you are guilty? No. You hope something happens to keep them from showing up. Now, he says their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Verse 16. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Who's going to be, you think of the scene of the, the judging here. He says, there's a day that's coming. He says, according to my gospel, here's the good news. Now, does that sound like good news to you? There's a day coming. He says, when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Who knows your conscience? Jesus does. Now, I want you to think about that. Those are not things that we necessarily say to everybody. Somebody says, how, how are you doing today? My conscience is killing me. My conscience is bearing witness against me that I'm a fool, that I'm a wretch. I'm enduring tribulation and distress because I have rejected Christ in my life. It's not the way we talk, is it? but sometimes it would adequately describe what's going on. He's specifically talking to people before they came into covenant with Christ, but he's pointing out how ridiculous their thinking is. You think because you have the Old Testament and you can read it, that that makes you better than somebody who was just converted today, baptized into Christ today? He says, you're a fool, and you don't understand where you've come from. You think it's up to you, don't you? Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians in Rome are not getting along. And they have drawn their partiality based upon race. They've drawn them, are you Jewish or are you not Jewish? I'll be a friend with you. I won't be a friend with you. And once you realize, this same thinking can carry along to a lot of folks. If you remember in the book of Galatians, who it had affected? 
the apostle Peter. Whenever the Jews came around, Peter had been with the Gentiles and really had been enjoying those relationships. Then the Jews showed up. And what happened to Peter? Oh, let me get over here with my people. And he kind of pushed himself away from the Gentile Christians for a while. And here's Peter. And who shows up? Paul. You just imagine that for a moment, of the difficulty of standing before someone who God had used as an instrument to bring his message to the Jews and to say, you're partial, you're sinning, and you stand condemned before God. An apostle inspired by the Spirit of God to lead him into all truth, and who had he rejected? Jesus. So don't think, well, this won't won't affect me. It affected the saints in Rome. It affected Peter. And he had a change of heart. And that's the way we approach this life, by drawing lines as to who you talk to, who you don't talk to, who you think about, who you'll do things for, who you won't do things for. Be careful, you're going to lose it all. God wanted the saints at Rome to realize it's not these differences that make you anything great. What's going to bring them salvation? The gospel. Who's going to bring them salvation? Jesus Christ. Here they were. Now, it says, there's a day coming. He says, on that day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. There aren't going to be any secrets. I don't know if we ever think that way. Oh, I'll just do this. Nobody else will know. <laughs> That's foolish. You better act like every word you say is going to be posted on the largest billboard in town. Because God sure knows about it. The way you talk about each other, he says, you better make sure and understand everybody's going to know. Christ Jesus is going to judge the secrets of hearts. So be careful in how you go about things. Now, we're not going to cover it all. We're going to read it because we've got just a few minutes left. Verses 17 through halfway through verse 21 is one sentence. I hope you're ready. Because he's going to specifically address the Jews. Now, I just want you to notice what's here. This is kind of looking forward to where we're going to be next week. And I want you to see where the Jews were. And I want you to see how bad it was. And we're talking about the Jewish Christians here. We're not talking about just Jews in general. Verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Oh, you claim to know it all, huh? And yet, who have you forgotten? You forgot to look in the mirror. Isn't that what James 1 talks about? He says, you look into the scriptures, they're going to hold you up to the mirror, and you're going to have to look and see who are you really. Not who you pretend to be, not who you think you are on your own account, by your own conscience. Who are you really before God? Now, look at where they're at. He continues, the rest of verse 21. You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now, by the way, when he's using these terms, they're rhetorical questions. Guess what they were doing? It's okay for me to rob. It's not okay for you Gentiles to rob. It's forgivable for me to commit adultery, but not you. Oh, 
you know what, I can go into the idols and do whatever I want. You, you need to stay out. That one's going to be addressed later in chapter 14. That's how bad it got. Now, that should tell us something. If we think that we're immune to becoming arrogant and prideful based upon knowledge, it's time to look in the mirror and look hard and let Jesus tell us what's going on or else we'll die. But the gospel is good for all. And then what do you find in turning? Forgiveness and renewal of life in Christ. Well, Roland, next week we'll come back. We'll pick up in verse 17. Because I don't expect you to remember that whole sentence on your own.